Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Gigabyte Z790 Aorus Tachyons PCB. The board was provided by Gigabyte, so big thank you to them for sending it over for testing. And with that out of the way, let's get into it, starting off with some of the more noteworthy internal connectors that you get on the board, like these four M.2 slots right here. The first one of these is wired directly to the CPU and runs PCIe Gen 4x4, and then these three down here are all wired to the chipset, and these also run uh, Gen 4x4 each. Um, a pretty standard M.2 configuration for a Gigabyte Z790 motherboard, I think pretty much the vast majority of their lineup has their M.2s configured like this, with maybe the excep exception of the Z790 Extreme. Anyway, for other storage connectors, you get four SATA ports over here, which is a bit low for a Z790 motherboard, but then this board is really meant as like an overclocking focused motherboard, so I don't really have a problem with it only having four SATA ports, especially when you also have four M.2 slots, and there's no like bandwidth sharing, uh, bandwidth sharing going on between these. So you can use all of them at the same time, which is a unreasonable amount of storage for a test bench motherboard, in a way, uh, if you actually did that. So anyway, that's it for the storage connectors. Uh, you do get an internal USB Type-C header for uh, like front panel USB Type-C if your case has that, so that's over here. Um, and then for your PCIe lanes from the CPU, you do have PCIe switches over here. So the PCIe uh, distribution from the CPU is that you get uh, eight Gen 5 uh, lanes permanently wired into the primary PCIe slot. The other uh, X8, like the other eight PCIe lanes that are also Gen 5 go into the PCIe switches, and then those PCIe switches can either send those uh, eight lanes back up to the top slot or down to the bottom slot. So if you have just one uh, PCIe device uh, and it's on this PCIe slot, that can go all the way up to Gen 5 by 16. Um, but if you have two devices, you're going to be running Gen 5 by 16, and I mean Gen 5 by 8 on the top slot and Gen 5 by 8 on the bottom slot. Um, primarily, this is meant for multi GPU setups, but the motherboard, as far as I know, does not have an SLI license, so that's not really an option. But I guess for a work like a rendering workstation, you don't actually need uh, SLI. Uh, and AMD's Crossfire will run on literally any motherboard that has at least two X4 PCIe slots. Um, so you don't need a license for, for Crossfire to work. Um, so that will work on this motherboard. Uh, and funnily enough, uh, the board does have a auxiliary PCIe power connector over here. There's a six pin PCIe connector for extra power to the PCIe slots. I think uh, it's kind of silly because even if you plug in two RX480s into this, you're not going to overload the 24-pin, especially considering the fact that Gigabyte is using, f like, solid pins on all of the power connectors on this board, including the 24-pin, which makes it incredibly difficult to plug in and unplug. Um, just, like, fun fact, that's, like, the, one of the most noticeable differences between, like, a folded, tw a folded pin 24-pin and a solid metal pin 24 pin is the solid metal pins are really stiff um, to plug in. But anyway, so even if you add two RX 480s on the reference PCB, which pulls a ton of power from the PCIe slot, you really shouldn't be able to overload the 24 pin. Um, so this, I really see very little reason for this to exist because like you can't run, like this isn't a board that can run a four GPU setup. So, you know, like, yeah, if you could run four GPUs, you could have, like, four RX 480s, and there are other, well, you could potentially have cards with, like, a sensible amount of PCIe slot power draw, say, 50 watts, which isn't really that uncommon, and, but the thing is, if you only have two 50-watt cards, um, as in cards that pull 50 watts from the PCIe slot itself, like, that's not gonna overload a 24-pin. You'd need like three or four of those before it starts becoming a problem for the 24 pin. So th this connector is kind of kind of pointless, but it also doesn't hurt anything by being here. But yeah, you you don't like if you see this connect if you have this board, you see that connector, you can just pretend that it isn't there because you're not gonna. Th there's not really any like PCIe device configuration that you could realistically put into this that would overdraw the 24 pin. There's just not that many PCIe slots here. Anyway, uh, the bottom PCIe slot is wired directly to the chipset, and that runs Gen 3 by 4 
Um, so it's good for something like, I don't know, like a capture card maybe, um, Wi-Fi card, which the board comes with one, but maybe you have a Wi-Fi card that you like better or something. So, um, you know, if you have some extra, P like low speed PCIe devices, that, that slot is kind of ideal for that. Anyway, let's move on to the rear IO. Uh, here you find a Q Flash Plus button, which allows you to update the BIOS of the motherboard without even having a CPU installed in it. The main idea behind this is that you can update the BIOS of the motherboard uh, for a CPU that it doesn't already support if you don't have a compatible CPU. Um, but in theory, it might also be able to recover from like corrupted BIOSes. Um, though that's not its intended purpose. Its intended purpose is that you can just flash the BIOS without having a compatible CPU. Um, but, you know, sometimes, like, if you get lucky, it might also recover from corrupted BIOSes. Anyway, below that we have a limp mode button, which is Gigabyte's version of SafeBoot. Uh, basically, if the system isn't posting for whatever reason, uh, you can just hit this button, or if the, actually, even if the system crashes, you can still hit this button. And what this button, uh, button will do, it'll boot up the system at stocks, uh, like stock settings, but without clearing the CMOS. So you can get into the BIOS without having to, like, save, like, without having to reset the BIOS, which is super convenient if you're doing, like, a lot of memory overclocking, um, as you don't have to constantly save profiles as you make adjustments. You just use limp mode anytime you make an adjustment that doesn't work. And it is rather nice that, you know, Gigabyte has made this accessible from the back of the motherboard now. So even if you have the board in the case, you can get at this quite easily. Anyway, below that we have a full set of PS2 ports. Um, you might be wondering why a Z790 motherboard has a full set of PS2 ports, and there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, this board is targeted... Uh, very much at extreme overclocking, and in certain overclocking scenarios, your USB ports will just kind of stop working for one reason or another. Uh, and in those scenarios, PS2 ports usually still work. So that's why they're there. So you can have a PS2 keyboard and PS2 mouse, and you don't need to use any USB ports, and the board will still, like, uh, e even if all of the USB ports are, like, failing because of, like, very high VC... Well, actually, VCLK doesn't do that on Z790. But if you somehow end up in a situation where your USB ports just don't work, well, the PS2 ports will. Um, anyway, below that we have a bunch of USB Type-A, and then more USB Type-A, along with an HDMI output for the iGPU. Uh, Intel Wi-Fi 6E, um, which I think also includes Bluetooth functionality, then 2.5 gig LAN from Intel, then more USB Type-A, as well as a USB Type-C and then a full set of port, uh, audio ports, including an optical output. So, basically a, like, I mean, you know, you could argue like, oh, it doesn't have 10 gig LAN, but if we ignore what I would consider exotic connectors, this is, well, arguably PS2 ports are exotic connectors in this day and age, but, um, yeah, the, this is a very, like, it's, it's full. Like, they've run out of space. Like, personally, I would have preferred to see some more USB Type-A ports if I was going, if I was using this motherboard as, like, in a daily setup instead of as a test bench. In a, in a test bench uh, environment, this is actually a very, like, this is more USB ports than I ever use on a test bench. But, um, yeah, in a daily setup, you, you might, you know, depending on what your daily is set up to do, you might want more USB ports. Unfortunately, there's just not enough space here. Um, right, like the, the PS2 ports basically make that impossible. Um, and I think that's a fair trade-off for a motherboard that's really targeted at, uh, you know, extreme overclocking. So, anyway, that's the rear I.O., which is base. like, I would consider this fully featured for a motherboard, considering what this motherboard is for. Um, Anyway, moving on, uh, we have an internal USB Type-A connector. The idea behind this is actually very simple. Um, if you have the motherboard on a test bench, you might not be able to conveniently reach the rear I.O. You will be able to reach this because you want to have access to, well, all of this stuff over here. So if you can access this, well, you can also access this USB port. So this is like a front panel USB port for test bench applications, basically, even though in a case it would be like an internal USB type A. Um, anyway, so that, that's the idea for that. Um, it might also be the dedicated port for BIOS updates, but uh, I'd have to check the manual for that, and I didn't bother to. So, 
Anyway, let's talk about the overclocking features. We have a giant postcode, which I'm a big fan of. You can see this thing from across a room. You literally don't even have to be right next to the test bench to read it because it's huge. It's like twice as big as a regular postcode and that makes it twice as good. Um, so I'm a big fan of the massive postcode on this thing. Um, Below that we have a reset button, which is just your standard reset button. Then right below the reset button we have clear CMOS, which I am not a fan of. I mean, I, you know, I'm a fan of having the clear CMOS button, but I am not a fan of its position. Uh, this is a button that if you're doing a lot of overclocking you might be hitting quite regularly. And below clear CMOS we have the retry button, another button that you might be pressing quite regularly. And you know, if you're if you're hitting these and you're not paying attention, you might accidentally clear the CMOS. Which is why I don't think this is a good place for the clear CMOS button to be. Um, I would have liked, like, yeah, like this, like, I it, it should be on the board. The board should definitely have a clear CMOS button, but I question the decision to put it in between two buttons that you would hit on a very regular basis. Um, anyway, let's talk about what the retry button does, which is basically a hard reset. So, funny thing with Intel CPUs, and I think you can also manage this with Ryzen chips, but it's far more difficult to do. But with Intel CPUs, it's quite easy to crash the CPU so hard that the reset button stops working. Um, the retry button always works, because the retry button isn't your usual reset procedure. No, this button basically just disconnects the power supply from the motherboard, or more, it disconnects the motherboard from the power supply, because it, it, it disconnects it on the motherboard and on the power supply, and it doesn't tell the power supply to disconnect, it, it uh, cuts the power from the motherboard side. So, this is a really hard reset. This, like, if the system is locked up for any reason, and, like, reset doesn't work, and the power button doesn't, retry does. Um, the other use for this is if you're trying to boot some very difficult memory settings, you can just use the retry button to basically force the memory controller to try again and again and again and again and again, and if you get lucky, uh, the memory controller might suddenly figure out how to run the memory, um, which is a real thing with Intel CPUs. It's really annoying. Anyway, below that we have buttons that aren't for solving annoying uh, things. We have, or, well, we have buttons that get you into annoying situations. We have the clock up and clock down buttons. These can be reassigned to change either the CPU ratio or the BCLK. The CPU ratio won't really put you into an annoying scenario, but the BCLK definitely can. The BCLK, like, raising the BCLK too much is a very quick way to end up needing the retry button. Um, but anyway, so yeah, th these can control BCLK or ratio on the fly. These, what I really like about these is these are hardware level. You don't need any, like, software in Windows to, to change the clocks. Like, these always work, um, so they're super convenient if you're trying to save, like, a high memory frequency validation or something, because you don't have to be messing around with any software in Windows. You can just press the button, save your validation file, press the button, save your validation file, press the button, your system locks up, you hit the retry button, and continue. Um, anyway... Um, below that we have a power button, which is a power button. It turns the system on, and if you hold it for 10 seconds, it turns the system off. Um, or you could just use retry in that scenario. Anyway, below that we have another limp mode button, because again, if you're on a test bench, you might be not, might not be able to reach this one. Um, so you do get a limp mode on the edge of the board here, uh, and that's just safe boot, gets you into the BIOS, uh, without the BIOS getting reset. So you boot at stock settings, but all of your settings are still there. Um, and then next to that we have a whole bunch of switches. Um, starting off with the single BIOS, a uh, dual BIOS mode switch. Um, so this board does have two BIOS chips on it, and that means it has Gigabyte's obligatory automatic dual BIOS, which is infuriating, because the automatic dual BIOS will basically uh, switch you between these two BIOS chips based on what, like, if you fail to post too many times in a row, the board will go like, oh, maybe something's wrong with the BIOS chip, let's switch to the other one, and it's like, no, I just screwed up my memory settings, stop doing that. Um, so, we have the dual BIOS disable switch, or 
single BIOS mode enable switch, depending on how you look at it. And the first thing you should do with this board when you get it is put this switch into the number two position, which is why it's, it's in the number two position in this, in this photo, because I took this photo after already using the board. Uh, from the factory, it comes in the number one position, which means your automatic dual BIOS is turned on, and the board will randomly go back and forth between the two BIOS chips, which is really annoying. So you put it into the number two position, and then the board behaves like it only has one, bi uh, one BIOS chip. And you might be like, but doesn't that, like, negate the functionality of dual BIOS? Well, no, it doesn't, because then we have another switch, which controls which BIOS chip is active. So you can manually choose if you're on the main BIOS chip or the secondary BIOS chip, and this is obviously very convenient if you're like trying to test uh, overclocking differences between two BIOS versions, or if you somehow just wreck one of the BIOS chips. You still have another one that will hopefully still work. So um, yeah, this, this is a feature. Like th these two switches alongside the, the two BIOS chips is like, this, this is a feature that I really wish was more common on more motherboards, but... Well, it isn't. And I, I should say, I don't want Gigabyte's automatic dual BIOS. Because it's, like, I'd rather have one BIOS chip than automatic dual BIOS. Because automatic dual BIOS is actually infuriating. Um, which is why all of, like, Gigabyte's overclocking fo overclocking focused boards always had the dual BIOS disable switch. Um, th this switch. Like, this, this has been on Gigabyte boards, or, like, high-end Gigabyte boards, for as long as they've been doing the automatic dual BIOS thing, because... Yeah, it, it, like, it gets in the way more often than not. Um, anyway, above that we have a trigger switch, which is basically Gigabyte's name for slow mode. This switch just drops the CPU clocks as low as they go. Really convenient if you're, like, you know, sitting in the OS on LN2 and you're, like, messing around with saving a screenshot or something, and you don't want to be doing that at, like, 7 gigahertz, because it might crash while you're saving your screenshot, and that would be really awkward. Or, in well... Infu more like infuriating, depending on how much time went into that screenshot. Um, anyway, uh, above that we have the OC ignition but uh, OC ignition switch. This switch basically keeps the power supply running while the board is able to turn on and off. Um, now, Gigabyte for some reason keeps saying, "Oh, this is a great way to like leak test your water cooling loop or to fill your water cooling loop." I strongly disagree with that because, like. Sure, if you're using the OC ignition switch, the, like, VRM won't be outputting power, the chipset won't be turned on, you know, all of your, like, your memory won't be running, but if the power supply is running, there's 12 volts all over the 12 volt power planes. So you'll have 12 volts all over here, you'll have 12 volts all over here, actually, you'll, you'll have 12 volts all over, in, like, everywhere because there's like 12 volts is used around the motherboard for all kinds of things. Every single fan header has 12 volts going to it. And 12 volts is what does all of the damage if you get water on your board, or at least does the majority of the damage if you get water on your board. So uh, using this for filling a water cooling loop is, in my opinion, not a great idea because you still have 12, like you still have 12 volts going into the board. If you're filling the loop, you should use a power supply that isn't connected to the motherboard so that you can fill the loop without the motherboard getting any power so that in case you did screw up and you do spill water all over your hardware, at least it's not getting, volt. at least the hardware isn't getting fed any voltages. Um, so... Yeah. Now, in LN2 overclocking scenarios, this switch actually makes a ton of sense because you might have, like, a motherboard socket heater that's connected, powered by the same power supply that's powering the motherboard. And if you're having, like, boot-up issues, well, you need the p socket heater to keep running so the back of the board doesn't get covered in ice or, like, actually even the front of the board doesn't get covered in ice, right? Because if you're running a socket heater, you're trying to minimize the amount of condensation that is building up everywhere. And yeah, if, if the board isn't running um, and the power supply isn't running, then your socket heater wouldn't be running. But with the OC ignition switch, you can keep your socket heater running while still just using one power supply. Otherwise, you'd have to have like a second PSU for the socket heater. So for that thing, for that scenario, this is actually useful. But for like filling water cooling loops, uh, no. <laughs> I would strongly not recommend using this for... for filling water cooling loops because it, it doesn't solve the main issue of like, well, your motherboard's still getting high voltage to, to it, uh, by which I mean 12 volts. Relatively speaking, in, in like motherboard voltages, 12 volts is the highest voltage you regularly see on a motherboard. So um, 
yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, we've sort of got the full array of uh, switches and buttons for an extreme overclocking board, and then we've got voltage read points. And we've got these three, which, like, th this to me is actually, yeah, like, this is kind of, kind of silly. Like, you don't see this on any other motherboard, because we've got three V-Core voltage read points. So you've got core voltage die sense, you've got core voltage socket sense, and then you've got core voltage super I.O. So you can check the voltage that I do believe the super I.O. chip is this chip right here. Uh, so you can check that the like what the super I.O. chip is seeing. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can. Um, it's there. So... Yeah, anyway, the socket voltage sense, this one's really simple. This is literally just connected. I'm not sure if it's connected to the, like, top side of the motherboard or the back side of the motherboard, but basically uh, it gives you a convenient way of measuring the voltage somewhere in this area or uh, this area. Um, so that's the socket voltage sense. Um, and that's not super accurate because obviously if you're uh, pushing a lot of current into the CPU, well, there's going to be, be a significant amount of voltage drop across the CPU socket itself. So this voltage reading, especially under load, is going to be a lot higher than what the actual silicon is getting. And that's why we have V-Core die sense over here. Um, and now this is actually, you, this is actually kind of fiddly to implement because the die sense circuitry is very sensitive. So you can't just run wires uh, from your voltage read point to the die sense circuitry, that would be a very bad idea, um, as you would potentially introduce all kinds of noise, like you'd have all kinds of noise getting picked up uh, and fed into the die sense circuitry, which would make the VRM controller very sad, um, potentially. Like, not necessarily always. Like, I've stabbed die sense with a multimeter in the past. You shouldn't do that, but... On motherboards where you don't have a dedicated die sense voltage read point, that's kind of the easiest way to do it, and you just kind of got to hope that things work out if you're doing that. But anyway, with this board, you don't have to worry about that because uh, there's this chip right over here, which is an op amp, and the idea here is basically the VRM controller uses the die sense voltage reading to do its job. So it has a very, act like, it has a direct connection basically to the voltage that the CPU, like the CPU silicon itself is seeing, and this voltage read point is basically provided by Intel specifically for the voltage regulator. This op amp um, basically also gets that voltage reading, and Gigabyte can ensure that that op amp is connected to this without, you know, running it, like, like, you basically don't want to be running your Dyson circuitry, like, so, like this or something, like, that would just be bad, right? You also wouldn't want to run it all the way down to the super I.O., because, the, the more distance it's covering, the harder it's going to be to make sure that it doesn't pick up interference from some switching regulator somewhere, um, or from, like, a GPU above it or something like that. So, um, instead you have this op amp, and so the op amp on the side that's connected to Dyson, so they can make sure that it doesn't cause any issues. And then on the output of the op amp, it copies basically the Dyson voltage and sends it over to the uh, die sense voltage read point as well as the super IO chip down here somewhere. Um, and so basically on this board, um, you can get like die sense voltage readings, uh, in software from the super IO chip. So even if you check your voltage in like CPU Z, you're going to get a very accurate voltage reading. And also, uh, you can just use your multimeter to check exactly what voltage the CPU is getting fed. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty cool feature. Uh, if you care a lot about having, like, the utmost precision when it comes to voltage measurements. Uh, there are other motherboards out there that do this. Um, a lot of high-end Asus motherboards do the exact same thing. They just have an op amp to copy the die sense voltage to the super I.O., as well as voltage read points, depending on which specific, As like, high-end Asus motherboard you're looking at. Um, I think they only have the voltage read points on, like, the extremes and the apex boards, and I think the gene. Um, but yeah, so you have more ways to measure core voltage on this board than I think is even remotely necessary, because really the only measurement that matters is die sense, because that's what the CPU is getting. Um, what, you know, what you have on the back or front of the motherboard is like, well, that's not what the CPU is getting, so that doesn't really matter that much, but uh, you can measure that too. So you have all of the core voltage measuring points that you could ever want, uh, and more than that even, because I have no idea why you'd want the super IO reading, but it's there. Um, 
I guess you can check the super I like if the super IO is connected to die sense or socket sense with with this read point. I, I don't again, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you have the option. Then we get voltage read points for the chipset, the 1.05 volt rail for the CPU reserved, which I don't know what it is because I couldn't find my notes don't say anything about what this is. So I'm going to say that I couldn't figure out what this is for. Uh, this is for CPU VDD2, and then we have the CPU VCC in auxiliary. So you can basically check every voltage that is generated on the motherboard, and uh, none of the voltages that are generated inside the CPU. Because with 13th gen, uh, like, VCC in is converted into voltages like CPU VDDQ, VCCSA. Um, there's also a bunch of PLL voltages which are generated internally in the CPU. And yeah, you, you can't measure any of those, but... You can measure everything that's actually produced on the motherboard. Um, and you also get die sense voltage readings, which is really cool. Um, anyway, so in terms of like overclocking, voltage read points, buttons, switches, readouts, you got everything, in my opinion. Like, yeah, it, it does everything. So I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this. I wish more motherboards came with this. <laughs> this is like top 10 reasons to get a tachyon is like this right here. Uh, at the very top. Anyway, let's move on to the power delivery. You do get two 8-pin power connectors on this board. Um, you only really need to plug these in if you're pushing a 13900K or a 13900KS. For the lower core count CPUs, a single 8-pin is more than enough, especially when Gigabyte is, you know, using solid metal pins for all of the power connectors. So that's like the high current variant of the 8-pin power connector, basically. Um, which means, technically, if your power supply has like 16 gauge cabling, you could get away with just the single 8 pin power connector for a 13900KS. But I'm also going to say, like, if you're buying a board of this caliber, you should probably have a power supply that has two 8 pins. And if you have two 8 pins, you should plug them in, because you can. And it's very, like, it slightly reduces the voltage, uh, like, the power loss in the power cables, um, which. The thing is, the VRM can compensate for the voltage being slightly lower or slightly higher. It really doesn't care if it gets fed, like, 11.8 volts or 12 volts or 12.2 volts. The, the VRM can deal with that. Um, so, like, plugging in both of the 8 pins isn't gonna, like, dra like it's not gonna affect your overclocking capabilities, but, um, yeah, if you don't have, like, 16-gauge cabling, a 13900K could get this power connector pretty damn hot. Um, Anyway, or even at the PSU end, because I think I've seen some PSUs where the like CPU A pin on the PSU side is actually a six pin, which is ridiculous. But yeah. Um, anyway, um, so you do get your two eight pin power connectors, and then for the actual VRM itself, we've got all of this. And this is a rather odd VRM configuration. Um, not in like a bad way, just literally like it's an odd number of phases. Um, so, down here we have VCC and AUX. Um, we'll get to what... The, that is a horrible N. Uh, so that's our auxiliary rail for the integrated voltage regulator of the CPU. Then up here we have iGPU power. Um, and then the rest of this is vCore. And vCore is literal has an odd phase count because it's literally 15 phases. Um, yeah, ver a very odd number of phases. <laughs> Like, very literally. The funny thing is, you might be looking at this and it's like, oh, it's because, like, you know, we've got, uh, like, in total, this adds up to 16. But the thing is, this is a Renaissance uh, RAA uh, 229131. Yes, I do remember correctly. Uh, 229131. This is a 20 phase controller. Um, so if Gigabyte actually wanted to max out the controller, they could have gone for like a 19 plus one. And I mean, that would have still been very odd, but it would have been less odd than 15 because 15 is kind of a random number to go for when you have a 20 phase controller and you're only using one of the extra phases for your, like you're only using one phase for the iGPU. Not that it really matters. Like this isn't going to affect the power delivery. Like it, this isn't going to stop the board from being able to power a 13900k without any issues it's just like i'm used to high-end motherboards maxing out the vrm controller more because they can rather than because it's necessary so seeing a, a high-end motherboard where the vrm controller isn't maxed out is just kind of odd um 
Anyway, the RIA uh, 229131 is the top of the line uh, voltage controller from Renesas that for like motherboards right now. Actually, well, motherboards, I've not seen it used on any GPUs, so I'm going to assume that it's actually just not compatible with like GPU voltage regulator standards. Um, but uh, yeah, running in 15 plus one, uh, 15 plus one phase mode. Uh, and uh, yeah, so can't really complain about the controller being used here. And so I guess let's just move on to the power stages. Um, for the power stages, we've got Renesas RAA 220105. And I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be a 4 at the end of this part number. And for some reason, there isn't a 4 in my notes. Um, but anyway, these are 105 amp smart power stages from Renesas. And smart power stages are called smart power stages because they integrate a whole bunch of monitoring, like monitoring and safety features that you don't necessarily get with a DR MOS component or other types of power stages. So these integrate current monitoring, temperature monitoring, overcurrent protection, over temperature protection, and other safety features that we're not going to get into because there's too many of them. And some of them aren't self-explanatory from the name. So I don't like talking about them because I feel obligated to explain what they actually do because th the name is kind of misleading if you don't know what it actually means. But anyway, um, yeah, these are smart power stages, which is basically as good as it gets for um, power stages these days. Uh, 105 amp nominal current rating. The Like these are very efficient, but you wouldn't actually want to run 105 amps through these. And Renesas won't even tell you how much heat they're going to produce above 60 amps output anyway, because if you're pushing more than 60 amps through a single power stage, you've done something wrong. Um, and it's just like, you're like, it, it's a bad idea. So this really, like, the, the reason I bring this up is it is incorrect to look at a motherboard like, like a VRM like this and basically go 15 times 105. That does not work. You're going to end up with an insanely high, like, nominal current rating and if you actually tried to put that much current through the vrm it would produce so much heat that it would be just completely uncoolable so don't do that that does not work um but you can basically look at this number and go like okay these are somewhat more efficient than like 90 amp smart power stages most of the time there are some very efficient 90 amp parts out there but um yeah like th these are generally going to be better than like 90 amp parts by a little bit or 70 amp parts again by a little bit because the funny thing is once you go past like the 60 amp rating for for power stages they all tend to be kind of similar in terms of performance um though these are one of the exceptions where it's like oh yeah these are actually like better than say renaissance uh 90 amp parts um Whereas the like Renesas 90 amp parts are awfully similar to Renesas 60 60 amp parts, um, but anyway, so top of the line Renesas power stages combined with a top of the line Renesas voltage controller. Uh, unfortunately, I've not had the board on the oscilloscope yet. However, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that this board performs exactly the same as the Z690 Tachyon because this VRM is quite similar, and also because Gigabyte doesn't really they don't really go and tweak the VRM controller firmware very much. So, um, yeah, if you're wondering what LLC setting to use, I'm going to go ahead and say that optimally it's probably low. Um, low LLC is probably going to deliver the best voltage regulation on this board because that's the optimal LLC setting for literally every LGA 1700 gigabyte motherboard that I have measured. So... Yeah, and that includes the Z690 Tachyon. So, anyway, let's talk about the uh, current handling capabilities. Oh, man, I got ahead of myself with the voltage regulation because we should I should have saved that for the capacitors. Oh, well. Anyway, 1.2 volts output voltage and 500 kilohertz switching frequency. Um, 500 kilohertz switching frequency. Uh, this VR, the power stage, oh, so this is going to be power stages and inductors. Like, one of the annoying thing with, with various power stages is the manufacturers don't all use the same, like, efficiency uh, or, like, heat dissipation, uh, like, ratings, where some manufacturers specify just the power stage, some include the inductor. Uh, these include the inductor, and the problem with that is, like, Gigabyte's not using the exact same inductors. At lower currents, this is less of a problem, but at high currents, the inductors start playing a bigger and bigger role uh, in the overall heat, like, heat output of the VRM. Though, 
I mean, at 200 amps output current, uh, and this is where like the inductors really don't play much of a role, this VRM should only produce about 14 watts of heat, um, which is very, very efficient. In fact, I'm relatively certain you can't get better efficiency than this, because the funny thing is, uh, all power stages have a peak to their efficiency curve, and that peak is relatively early in the curve, but like, if you keep adding more of them, you're actually like, Basically, if you're designing a VRM, um, you'll have an efficiency curve that looks like this. And so if you have too many power stages, you're going to end up in, like, this area. And if you have too few power stages, well, actually, this would... It's not linear, it's like... And, that, like, it starts to really fall off towards the end. Again, that's why you shouldn't put 105 amps through your 105 amp smart power stages, because you're going to end up over here somewhere. Uh, and that's bad. But anyway, so you have, like, a relatively small peak of efficiency. And if you have too many power stages, you end up here. If you have too few, you end up somewhere in this area. If you end up off the chart, your power stages burn up and die. Um, that, that's, <laughs> that's why the chart exists. It's like, if you're past the end of the chart, things are very bad. Um, but most high-end Z790 motherboards suffer from basically being uh, in this area for, like, ambient overclocking. Um, now, funnily enough, it, having, like, more power stages than absolutely necessarily still absolutely, like, than is optimal still leads to lower VRM thermals because the heat gets spread across more components, so the thermal density gets lower and your temperatures come down. But from a, like, theoretical peak efficiency perspective, this board is pretty much right on top of it, um, as far as I, like, as, as far as I know, so, um, yeah, it's worth noting that obviously there's some error in, involved in this, because, like, these inductors aren't exactly the same as the ones Renesas used for their ratings, but at 200 amps it should be close enough. Um, anyway, at 300 amps output, this VRM should produce about 23 watts of heat, and this pretty much covers the current draw range for a, like, water-cooled 13900K. Um, because past this, like, past 300 amps, the chip is just completely uncoolable, even if you have it direct die. Like, it gets very, very, very hot very fast. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, um, going past this, let's say you had, like, a water chiller or something, you might be able to start approaching 400 amps output current. At this point, the VRM would produce about 33 watts of heat, and now VRM heatsinks are actually necessary. Like, here, like this, you can totally do without a VRM heatsink on this board. And, in fact, even this you could probably do without a heatsink, because while it is... You know, it's above one watt per component, and it's approaching two watts per component. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's kind of approaching two watts per component. Uh, the board does have a 10-layer PCB, um, so it should do a pretty good job of, like, self-cooling just due to having more copper in the PCB itself. Um, but anyway, uh, at 400 amps, which is, like, impossible to hit with regular cooling methods, the VRM should produce about 33 watts of heat, at which point, yeah, you'll, you're you going to need a VRM heatsink. Also, you're probably not going to get there. Um, here, I mean. Well, yeah, you're not going to get to that 400 amps. But anyway, going above that 500 amps output current, the VRM should produce about 48 watts of heat, and then 600 amps of output current, it should produce about uh, 66 watts of heat. So not the most powerful VRM that you can get on a high-end Z790 board, but still, like, if the thing is, if you're in this, like, LN2 overclocking territory of current draw, you're probably not going to be running Prime 95 for an hour, right? Like, that that's the big difference between, like, uh, ambient VRM considerations and extreme overclocking VRM considerations, is, like, you the VRM just has to not overheat before your, like, three-minute benchmark finishes. And three minutes is actually a very long benchmark for, for a lot of multi-core stuff, like Cinebench is very short, Y Cruncher, at least the configurations that people regularly run, is seconds. Um, there are versions of Y Cruncher that would l run for like many, many minutes, but nobody benches those on LN2, so you don't really have to worry about that. Um, and so that's kind of the thing is like, yeah, at this point, you know, the VRM cooling would start becoming a concern, except you're also running your workloads for such short periods of time that the VRM is just not gonna like you're not gonna have time for the vrm to get up to a high temperature before the workload finishes whereas in ambient overclocking scenarios like if you have the cooling system you could run 300 amps into a 13900k almost indefinitely um 
So, you know, you, you do actually, like, that's the scenario where the VRM actually needs to be able to, like, has to not produce so much heat that it just keeps increasing in temperature. And so after an hour, your VRM is causing thermal throttling, which this won't. Um, because, yeah, even, like, even though it's not, you know, like, it's just 15 phases, there are 20 phase Z790 motherboards out there, this is still extremely efficient. Um, and the board comes with a rather substantial VRM heatsink, so, um, yeah, that's, that's not a concern. Oh, I usually leave this on, don't I? Yeah, it's been so long since I've done a PCB breakdown, I've kind of forgotten how I do these. Um... Anyway, so that's the current handling capability. And now let's talk about the filtering uh, on this board. So the inductors are actually a really weird, um, and I, the inductors are the one reason I kind of want to, like I still want to get oscilloscope measurements for this board. I'm just not in a rush because again, like it's a gigabyte board. It almost certainly only, like it almost certainly behaves exactly the same as every other gigabyte board I've used, even if the VRM looks very different at a glance. Uh, these are 470 nano Henry uh, inductors, which is really, really high. Um, for comparison, the Z690 board was using 150 nanohenry inductors. Um, now, the funny thing is, the Z690 board had, like, the exact same voltage regulation as any other Z690 gigabyte motherboard that I tested. So, evidently, it is, it doesn't really, like, I, I don't think this is really going to make a difference here. Um, and generally speaking, higher inductance, uh, inductors would usually cause, like, more load release overshoot. Um, but without testing that, I'm not, you know, not going to commit to saying, like, yeah, this board definitely has more load release overshoot because I've not measured it. And there's a pretty decent chance that it doesn't. Um, so, it, like, it really depends on how the VRM, like, also depends on how the VRM controller is set up. And so, yeah, um... But I do find it interesting that Gigabyte, like, between the Z690 board and the Z790 board, they went up to these 470 nanohenry inductors, which, if anything, it adds cost to the board. Because to get a higher, like, a high current rating inductor in a higher inductance means, like, you just need a bigger inductor. Because it need like, the current rating of an inductor is basically tied to, uh, well, you have the saturation rating, which is tied to the core material, but then you also have just the, like, DC current rating, which is tied to how thick the wire going through the inductor is. Um, and so I find it very... And with, like, high inductance, you need more windings in the inductor. So it's like, okay, so you're going to have a longer piece of wire, so it's going to have to be more thicker. And it also has to be longer because higher inductance. And it's like, I'm really not sure why they opted for these 470 nano Henry inductors. Um... I'm going to be even more confused once I have the board on the oscilloscope if I discover that it performs exactly the, se the same as the Z690 board does. Because, like, why? Maybe they have less coil wine? I've seen these other indu these inductors on other Gigabyte boards, so it might be that they just switched suppliers for, for, like, inductors in general, and now they just use these everywhere instead of the 150s that they used to use a lot for, like... I mean, they used 150s on, like, B550, X570, so it might be part of that as well. Um, oh yeah, generally speaking, high inductance inductors put less stress on the input filtering, but more stress on the output filtering because you have more energy that gets stored in the inductor. And then when your CPU stops pulling significant, like goes from pulling a lot of current to pulling very little current, that energy has to get dumped into the output filtering capacitors. So speaking of the output filtering capacitors, there is a lot of them. Um, yeah, this board has 33... 470 microfarad um, pulse caps from Panasonic. So tantalum polymer uh, SMD capacitors, right? That's like pulse caps are just like a, a brand name of capacitor. They're not a type of capacitor. These are tantalum polymers and they're from Panasonic and Panasonic calls their SMD tantalum polymers pulse caps. So that's what these are. And there's 33 of them. Um, yeah, and, like, the iGPU has some for its filtering, like, VCC and AUX has that for uh, for its output filtering, but when I say 33, these are just vCore. There's 33 of these just on vCore, which is an absolute ton. Um, and, you know, we have a whole bunch of them in the CPU socket itself, right behind the CPU, and then, of course, we have all of the ones on the front of the board. Um, and 
the thing is, so technically SMD uh, tantalum polymers do have like lower ESR and lower ESL than through hole polymer capacitors. Uh, however, uh, like I mentioned, the Z690 tachyon already had, I think, I'm not sure if it was the exact same number of capacitors, but very similar uh, output filtering configuration, and it performed exactly the same as every other Z690 gigabyte motherboard that I tested, because um, they all performed the same. So I feel like Gigabyte, when they're configuring their VRMs, basically has like a target of like VRM performs like this, and once the VRM reaches it, they don't go past that. So I kind of feel like these are, a, like, there are benefits to this if you're, like, for LN2 overclocking, like, it makes insulating around the CPU socket more convenient and that kind of thing. But from, an, like, I get, usually, usually I get excited about, like, SMD polymer capacitors, be they tantalum or aluminum polymers, because they have like voltage regulation benefits, potential voltage regulation benefits. And unfortunately on every gigabyte motherboard that I've measured with them so far, those voltage regulation benefits have gone unrealized um, because I think gigabyte literally just like they have a target for how the VRM is support, supposed to perform. Once it reaches that level of performance, they leave it alone. Um, which to be fair, like the voltage regulation on all of their Z690 boards was good. There wasn't any board that had like massive voltage regulation issues, but at the same time, they all performed the same, which is kind of sad when you have a board packing 33, 470 microfarad pause caps and, and it performs the same as a board packing like 10 through hole polymers. It's like we've got more capacitors in parallel, which again has benefits for ESR and ESL. These are just inherently better filtering capacitors than through hole polymers. And then you measure it with an oscilloscope and it's like, oh, this, this is the same as all of the other boards. Um, well, they don't hurt anything though. So I guess I can't like, you know, like, like I wish this board did a better job of getting a straight line on the oscilloscope basically. Like it does a good enough job. It's not, you know, you don't have to use like ridiculous amounts of e-droop to get good voltage regulation. Well, you do need kind of a lot, but not like so much that you can't really push a 13900K to its limits. So, um, yeah, it's just like, like looking at this board, seeing all these pause caps, and then, I mean, looking at the Z690 board, seeing all the pause caps, then I measured it, and I was like, kind of disappointed, because I was really hoping for more. Um, and I imagine this board is exactly the same, especially since they like increased the inductance. But anyway, uh, like the cap, like these capacitors are significantly more expensive than the through hole ones. And I, I, like they do make insulating for LN2 easier. So I guess that's nice. Uh, for input filtering, we've got a very, very overkill input filter. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of also tantalum polymer capacitors. These are 100 microfarad. Uh, yeah, 100 microfarad uh, Kemet tantalum polymers. Uh, so co-caps, if I remember correctly. Um, so Kemet is another like tantalum polymer capacitor manufacturer like like Panasonic basically though a bit more specialized in tantalum capacitors than Panasonic like Panasonic makes basically everything uh Kemet is like a ta like they're kind of known for tantalum polymer capacitors anyway so these have uh so these should be co-caps as far as I know actually definitely because they have the little KO label on them so yeah co-caps uh from Kemet there are 100 microfarads. There's 16 of these. Um, yeah, which I would like the thing about input filtering is like on the output filter, you need to deal with very fast transients directly from the CPU. On the input filter, especially if you have high inductance inductors, you don't see those same transients that you see on the output side because they get blocked by the VRM. So using like SMD polymer capacitors of any kind, be that tantalum or aluminum, on the input filter to me is very, like, I think it's kind of unnecessary. Through-hole capacitors on input filtering do a perfectly good job. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe when I measure this board, it will have amazing, vol like, better voltage regulation than all the other Gigabyte boards, but... And then it would maybe justify this, you know, very elaborate configuration of capacitors, especially, like, the input side. But... 
I really doubt that's going to be that. I doubt that's going to happen. And so I really think for the input, they could have just gone with through hole capacitors. But hey, um, they don't hurt anything by being there. So, you know, it's just like it's like unrealized potential um, is, is what upsets me about this is like all these fancy capacitors. And yet it perform like and, and yet I can almost guarantee that this performs exactly the same as like a, a Z690 uh, Aorus Pro. I am. No, yeah, a Z690 Aorus Pro or a Z790 uh, Master, right? A board that doesn't have any of the, like, extra, like, the these more expensive capacitors for its filtering at all. Well, anyway, um, let's move on. Oh, I guess I should have mentioned the iGPU phase uses a... it. Oh, it does use an RAA220105. Yeah, so your iGPU has a uh, massively overkill power stage. If I'm not mistaken, the Z690 board had a 90 amp power stage for this. I guess this time around they couldn't be bothered switching reels in the production line, so they just used the 105 ones again. Um, anyway, that doesn't yeah, like iGPU. No, like I nobody cares about the iGPU. It's I don't care. So like you can use it if you want to, but I, I'm not concerned about like power delivery for the iGPU. Anyway, let's talk about VCC and AUX, uh, which is massive overkill in pretty typical gigabyte fashion. Uh, it's a two-phase, for one thing, and the controller for it is this chip right here, which we see on every gigabyte board. Uh, this is a Monolithic Power Systems MP2940, and the power stages used are 70 amp uh, smart power stages from Monolithic Power Systems, and those are MP87... 992s and yeah so you've got like two 70 amp smart power stages for a rail that i don't think will ever be outputting more than like 30 amps but you know if for some reason it had to output 40 amps it would only produce four watts of heat like this is massive overkill uh, of course it has tantalum polymer capacitors for output filtering because like look at all <laughs> like the actually i feel like they Oh, I, well, nope, no, nope. we have through-hole capacitors here and here and here, but, like, we have a tantalum for, oh, this one's for the 3.3 volts. Um, yeah, so that, that one isn't for the 12-volt the side of the PCIe slot. Actually, there's an off like, it's pretty typical on most motherboards to see a, like, through-hole polymer for 12-volt filtering right at the PCIe slot. This board's not doing that. Not that it should affect anything, because your GPU will generally not pull that much power from the PCIe slot, unless it's an RX 480, but also your GPU has its own power filtering on board. Like, it, GPUs have a ton of capacitors. The, so, yeah, like, the, the fact that the board isn't doesn't have the, like, bulk caps right by the PCIe slots, I don't really see that as a concern. It's just kind of interesting that it doesn't have them. Because most boards do. I guess it makes the M.2 heatsink uh, less annoying to to fit onto the motherboard if you don't have a great big capacitor sticking out of it right right where the M.2s are. Anyway, um, oh, I got distracted from VCC in. It's massive overkill. It's the same VCC and VRM you see on literally any other gigabyte motherboard. And it, as always, massive overkill. So that's kind of that. Uh, and now I guess we get to talk about the memory. Um... So this board, I mentioned it earlier, uses a 10-layer PCB. Um, and the way you configure this out on Gigabyte boards is actually Gigabyte puts this little layer count indicator on their motherboards. So here we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then if you go to the back of the board, you have, because boards are, like, the layer counts are symmetrical. So on the back, you have a 10. Um, so... Yeah, on the front you have like layers one, two, three, four, five, and then on the front on the back you have the the ten down here. I think it's down here. Anyway, so yeah, this is a ten layer PCB, um, and uh, the memory topology is a one DIMM per channel, right? So each uh, like you just have one like you have just one memory slot per per uh, channel on the CPU, and in terms of memory overclocking capabilities. Uh, Gigabyte QVLs the board to DDR5-8000. My experience with this board is that 7800 is, is doable um, with, like, full stability. It's a pain, but it is doable. You also need a good CPU for that to work. 7600 is absolutely trivial. Uh, 7600, well, 
There are some very, very bad CPUs out there that won't even do 7600. But if you have an average CPU, 7600 should be trivial to do. Um, but going past 7600 gets steadily more and more difficult. 7800, doable. And then once you get to like 8000, this port's kind of weird. Um, I, I never managed to fully stabilize, stabilize DDR5-8000 on this board. But what I find kind of weird about this board is getting Y-Cruncher VST stable was very easy. And it would fail on like other less, arguably less difficult stress tests. Um, which is really weird because I've seen other motherboards where like Y-Cruncher VST is just impossible. You try to run it at DDR5-8000 and it crashes within seconds and there's nothing you can do about it. You can sit there, use every combination of voltages, Y-Cruncher, and Y-Cruncher will not last more than like five minutes. This board can do hours of Y-Cruncher at 8000 quite easily. Not consistently, but it can, like, you, like if you get Y-Cruncher set up, it will run Y-Cruncher. <laughs> and then it won't run any, and then it won't run a bunch of other stress tests, which is just absolutely infuriating. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe I don't have the right memory kit. Maybe, actually, I don't think it's the CPU, because the, the CPU I'm using at this point is, like, better than any other CPU I have. And it's a CPU that, I've been told could do 8400 Y Cruncher on a certain motherboard. Um, so yeah, though funnily enough, if I take this board above 8000, so like 8200, Y Cruncher just completely fails. Um, so yeah, which like, it's not really that surprising because Y Cruncher breaks really hard one, once you push the memory speed too high on pretty much any motherboard. It's just that like, on most motherboards, even 8000 with Y Cruncher is really hard. And there's like a, a progress, like there's, it's somewhat progressive in terms of like how fast Y Cruncher crashes as you go up in speed. This board, you go from 8000 Y Cruncher, you do need to fiddle with the voltages. It doesn't just work on XMP, but you can get Y Cruncher to run. And then you go to 8200 and it doesn't at all. Um, so yeah, for like 24 seven stability, I basically would not consider this board capable of more than 7800. Um, I, I don't know how Gigabyte determines what they put on their QVL. I don't know what stress tests they use. If they use HCI mem test, then I can kind of like if, yeah, if they use like HCI mem test or if they use mem test 86, I can totally understand how eight, DDR5-8000 managed to get onto the, uh, QVL, especially if like, I, like the, the, the biggest... Like, again, I don't know how they stress test. I actually don't know how any motherboard manufacturer stress tests uh, for their QVLs. Um, but yeah, you, Gigabyte QVLs the board to 8,000. I can't get this board to do 8,000 to my stability standards. If you lower your standards, it can do 8,200 or even 8,400 if you get lucky. But if you don't lower your standards, I would say 7,800 is basically as high as this goes. Um, in terms of benchmarking, uh, I've run Geekbench 3 all the way up to like 8266, um, but more than that is very difficult. So overall, like my experience with this board has been kind of like for like pure benchmarking, I'd say worse than the Z790 Dark, um, better than an ITX, than the MSI Z790 ITX Edge board, and for... Um, 24 seven stability, I'd actually rate this like above the dark because the dark is like able to boot speeds and run benchmarks at settings that will never run a stress test. Like it's really, really good at that. This board, not so much. So, um, yeah. Um, but, um, so I kind of like, yeah, like it is a 10 layer PCB. It is a one dim per channel memory topology. But, and, and to be fair, like, it is significantly better than all of the Fordham motherboards I've tested for LGA 1700. So, like, this is doing something. It's just, I'd argue maybe not, well, I don't know. Like, it, I, so, yeah, I don't know how to rate it. Like, I, I've, I've not had a good time with, with pushing Intel memory controllers if I care about stability. If I throw stability out the window, the Tachyon's great. Not as good as the Dark, but it is still very, very good. And, like, 
second to the dark, basically. There's no other motherboard that I, I've gotten to clock as high as the Tachyon or the dark. Um, but, uh, yeah, if I actually do care about stability, it doesn't do DDR5-8000. So, um, yeah, um, that's, that's sort of my verdict on the memory overclocking side of things. And that, I think, covers everything with this board. Um, yeah, um... I really, like, I, I'm so conflicted, because on one hand, I love overclocking boards, and this is an overclocking board, and it does clock memory better than Fordim motherboards. Like, the Z790 Master uh, doesn't get anywhere near this thing. Um, the Z, like, which isn't surprising, the Z690 boards that I have don't get anywhere near this thing. Uh, well, the Z690 Tachyon actually gets awfully, is very similar in terms of memory overclocking, but... That's also a Tachyon board, so it's not that, like, I don't find that that surprising. But if I compare against any of the Fordim boards that I have, this is way better. Um, but then compared to, like, other extreme overclocking boards like the Dark for benching, the Dark, I'd say, is a bit better. And then for, like, 24-7 stability, well, it doesn't do DDR5-8000 unless you just ignore, uh, like, good stress testing practices. If you run one stress test for, like, two hours, you can do DDR5-8000. Sure. Um, if you actually run, like, a full battery of stress tests, it's going to fail at least one of them every single time. Um, which is infuriating. <laughs> but that's also been my experience on so many other motherboards at far lower memory speeds. So, um... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too hard on the Intel memory controller. Maybe maybe I'm using the Intel CPU wrong. You're not supposed to use, you know, you're not supposed to stress test your memory overclock. Just just ignore the blue screens. It's fine. They're not real. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's it for this video. Um, thank you to Gigabyte for sending over this board. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that's it. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, uh, hoodies, uh, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And I've also got a band camp uh, if for some reason you'd like to like torture your ears. There's a link to, there's links to all of that down in the description, so uh, if you'd like to support the channel, that would be much appreciated. And uh, that's it for the video, so thanks for watching, and goodbye.